Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. Now, I need your help. I need you to punch that like button in the throat like it harmed your dog. And I'd like you to subscribe if possible, because 50% of you have not subscribed. We are shooting towards 100,000, and you can help us do that. Anyways, on to the story. Humans are Teachers, written by John Galt. Snip was wet, her face dripping, palms slipping on the knife. It fell from her fingers, the nasty thin shard bouncing on the bulkhead beside the messy corpse between her thighs. Oh, her feck, she said. Her hearts were beating so fast, threatening to rip out of her chest and sprint down the hall all on their own. Her shaking hands came together, trying to still themselves. The rokine was still warm, its blood oozing out and running along the floor. Is this your inaugural experience of taking a life? Snip jumped off the body, scooping up the knife and holding it close, staring wide-eyed up at a... at a human. He was looking at Snip, expecting an answer. She knew English, how it sounded, but rarely spoke the language. Yes, she said. The human crouched over the body, pistol in hand, keeping a little distance between himself and Snip. He eyed the shaky knife warily, before looking down at the body using the nose of his pistol to turn open the Rakhine's vest. He stowed his weapon and reached for the Rakhine's sidearm, drawing it and checking the chamber. He removed the magazine, thumbing the ejected round and replacing it. He turned off the safety, the rack slamming home, ready to fire. Using a six-shooter makes it simpler. You don't have to get up close and personal as you do with a knife, he said, offering her the grip. She reached out, surprised to find the metal was warm. Her fingers wrapped around the handle. She knew not to point it toward him, keeping it aimed toward the ground, to only raise it when she intended to kill. You're a human, she said. Oh, and how did you discern that? I, I've seen humans before, uh, pictures in, in books. Uh, you're stuck on a station too, she said. He smiled at her, a crooked side on smile, while he said remained inclined towards the corpse. Missed them escape shuttles. Your kinfolk sure hightailed it out of here in a hurry, he said. That's what we do. The sift is run. We live on fleet of foot in salted soil. Ain't no use waiting on the cavalry, friend. They won't be riding in till the Rokhine are long gone, he said. He offered her the magazine he found on the Rokhine's hip. She looked at the pistol and knife. She eased down the latter and accepted them one at a time, tucking them into her waistband. Not until the Rokhine finish salting the station. Uh, s sorry, uh, finish looting. Uh, they, they won't stay. There isn't any money in actually running this fuel stop. Your scheme is to hold up till they ride on out of these parts, huh? Snip nodded. Her eyes followed the human as he rifled through the Rokhine's pockets, his hand pausing and a broad smile crossing his lips as he lifted a grenade from the bloodied corpse. He eyed her, watching the occasional afterquake run shivering down her fingers. These eased the grenade into his own coat and patted the pocket. It was better that way. She was no fighter. I had me the notion of stirring up some dust and... Uh, and you're welcome to go along if you are of mind, he said. I should stay in the vents, she said, nodding to the side where the vent cover had been unscrewed. The scattered food packets littered the floor where she had been caught. Well, reckon you can follow your own star, partner. May the winds of fortune favor you, he said. Wait, she said, looking up from her spot where she sat squat. She didn't know why she said it. He was a human. He wasn't going to hide in the vents. He wasn't going to let them trash and burn his station. So why did she ask him to wait? He stared at her, the same unspoken question in his eyes. Can I go with you, she said. Which tomes had folk like me between their pages, partner, he said. Louis L. Lamar. My, my father traded them from a regular fuel rat. A smile slowly crept across his face. He ran a finger along the brim of his hat and tipped it towards her, then rose, walking away from her vent, down the hall without another word. Snip glanced at the nasty dusty vent, screws puncturing through the sheet metal that liked to snag her clothes. He was getting further away, walking upright and confident, in the open, despite the occasional distant rumble that rocked the station and made the lights flicker. She grabbed a bunch of food packets, stuffing them down into her pockets and chased after him, keeping her finger off the trigger, remembering all the lessons on how to not shoot yourself in the foot. Snuff 
stood flat against the wall. The human stood on the far side of the corridor, mirroring her posture, his hand up, telling her to stop. He then lowered it slowly, and they both crouched down with it. He dropped his fingers down one at a time. Three, two, one. She hesitated for a fraction, then came around, pistol pointed forward to see the three rakhine fall away, leathery skin rippling from the shots. The hallway roared with gunfire as all three collapsed at the intersection. Again and again it rumbled as the first hits merely wounded them. He kept firing until the killing blow had been struck against all three. She saw it all, no finger hovering over the trigger, her mind trying to quiet itself, regaining control of her shaking hand. Her ears whined in a slowly easing scream. Good aim, but you'd best be the one squeezing the trigger on the next go-round, he said. Snip winced, but didn't lower her gun, keeping it pointed at the bodies as she walked up. He kicked them over one at a time. He was only satisfied and lowered his guard once he saw the broken state of each of them up close. She was getting better. She looked this time. She knew the next part. And now, he said. She put a new magazine in her pistol, made sure there was one in the chamber, and the safety was off. Good. And then? We make sure to hide them doors and shadows, she said, entering the intersection and hugging one wall. She glanced around the corner, gun pointed at nothing, then checked the opposite way. He watched her while squatting over her body. He waited until she finished before he eyed the rifle they had. Why are you teaching me? She said. Teachers, they just can't resist the soul hungry for knowledge, can they? He said. He picked up one of the rifles, nodding to himself, as he checked if his hand fit the shape of the grip. It looks heavy, she said, but they put him down more reliably, he said. She eyed the rifle he offered and holstered her still unfired pistol. The gun was bulky, built for creatures far larger than her. She saw him hold his own against his chest and mimicked him, keeping the weight close, getting a feel for it. She eyed the structure, pulling out the magazine to check it and get the feel for how heavy a full one was. She replaced the magazine and pulled back the bolt, checking the breech to see the shell slide in smoothly. He nodded. Also, uh, you're a fast learner. Not fast enough, she said while eyeing the shells. She wouldn't need to be so accurate, but it didn't matter what kind of weapon she had if she still wasn't going to shoot it. Rukain are not known for fancy firing, he said. Neither am I. None of that. You're the last of your kind still standing on this turf. It hadn't been by choice, dashing home to get her books instead of running like everyone else. Don't drown in them could haves and might have beens, partner. We need to figure our path right here and now, he said. They came from one corridor. One path led toward the docks where the road kind were thickest. Another wider tunnel led along, running down the length of the station. And a third went away where it would be quieter. Missing your vent, he said. We ain't done stirring the dust with that there grenade of yours, partner, she said and turned towards the wider corridor. Snip followed him through the hydroponics, coming out past the large tanks. It had been slow going and she still hadn't fired a shot. She had at least gotten reloading down to a fine art. When she did start firing, she was going to be a reloading champion. She followed him around a corner when she bumped into a wall of scaly lizard flesh. She raised a rifle only for it to be battered aside from her hands. Found the shit, he barked. Snip reached for her hip, but the world went black. She didn't even feel the sensation of falling back, just the wall crashing against her. She blinked away her days, only to be hammered again. Bouncing, then pressed flat against the wall, his arm across her chest, pressing her flat and forcing the air from her lungs. Who gave you that gun? shouted the Rokine. Snip looked past him, seeing two others just behind and the human further back. She bit her tongue. She just needed to hold on. Why hadn't he fired yet? Who's been killing my men? Snip's head rang, her face blooming out with pain and the vision in her right eye turning red. She glanced at the human, eyes pleading. She wanted to know why he wasn't helping. The human's eyes were filled with fire, watching her, willing her to use what he had taught her. She followed her hunch and reached into her coat. There she found the heavy metal grenade and had her answer. Why it had always been in her coat, why he wouldn't help, and why he couldn't. Snip pulled the grenade, thumb flicking out in the pen and letting the hammer fly away. The Rokine's eyes went wide, and he threw himself back, scrambling for traction on the smooth floor. Snip threw the grenade hard, soaring well past the Rokine. 
she reached down, drawing her pistol. The grenade went off in the distant hallway, shattering plastic panels and ringing the room like a drum. There was no flame, just a pain in her ears that took away all sound. Just one last lesson, said the human. She couldn't hear anything, not the scrambling rokai nor the crashing station, but she could hear the human's calm words. She stood, feet apart, both hands braced on the pistol as she guided her aim. His face by her shoulder. She knew that she could hit them. She had done it a dozen times already, but his guidance was reassuring. And fire, he said. The pistol was muted, thunder in her hands, striking each rokai at center mass. His hand eased away, stepping back as she fired the last of her shots and reloaded with smooth practice movements. Mighty fine shooting, he said. He smiled, ran a finger along the brim of his cowboy hat, tipping it towards her, and then was gone. Thank you, she said to the empty corridor, barely able to hear her own words. Snip sat at the air vent, squeezing her juice box and sucking on a straw. She sketched in the pad as she watched another Rokine ship leave. Twenty Rokine out, zero in. There was a distant rumble far off on the station that felt like more than heard, coming from the hydroponics side. Check bodies in hydroponics, rig new booby trap, she wrote. She cleaned the pistol, taking it apart and oiling the pieces. Her clothes and notebook stained black and red as she went. She pulled out one of the rolled-up cloth earplugs, eyeing the crusty blood and replacing it with a fresh one. Sixteen Rokine out, zero in, fine clean clothes. The Rokine on the dock were acting strange. They were running for some reason. Snip shuffled over a little, putting her shoulder to the rifle that she stole him from the armory. With her cheek against the stock, she could see through the scope. The Rukai were shouting at each other, making rude gestures at some of the loot that they had dragged out before jumping onto their ship. It was the third that had left in as many minutes. She'd watched the footage, all sifters had, watching the Rukai trash their homes through the security recordings, help them better hide their personal effects, but she had never seen them act like this before. She climbed along the tunnel, careful not to snag herself on the screws that mounted it in the place climbing along the clunky filters and humidifiers that blocked her way at points, then slid out into the corridor. She howled still for a moment, but she couldn't hear anything. She took it slow, making sure not to walk blind around any more intersections like an idiot, checking doors and corners as she went. The station rumbled as another transport took off and left. Snap held the auto shotgun, a long-range rifle slung over her back, pistol at the ready on her hip. She came out onto the docks to see them empty. It usually took them a month to tire of picking her home's bones clean, but they were gone only after six days. There were no transports, no sounds, nothing. Snip brought along the cargo flat, the machine rumbling along the rubber wheels behind her, a mound of bodies bouncing along with every imperfection in the floor. She set her teeth and grunted with effort of dragging them off the docking bay floor. There was a lot to clean up before her people returned, traps to dissolve, bodies to collect before they festered. She carried chunks over, her stomach turning as she tossed them into a wet pile. There was a tone on the dock and a snip brought up a rifle, backing up towards the entrance of the cargo bay while training the barrel on the faint docking fields that held the air in. There were few stars in the desert between galactic arms. It made picking out the dot that moved much faster. It grew in sight, large and bulky structure, turrets hanging off sides, armed to the teeth. It wasn't Rokhine, so Snip lowered her rifle. The ship passed through the docking field, its roaring engines suddenly thundering inside the docking bay and kicking up a wind. It lingered above the deck for a few moments, holding position as though deep in thought. She could see figures moving around in the cockpit, English written across the nose. The Daisy Marie in scrawling letters with barely dressed humans soaring against the wind painted on the side. Snip raised a hand, waving it awkwardly in a standard human greeting. The ship threw out its landing gear and dropped a cargo ramp, easing down with five humans shoulder to shoulder. Weapons hung loose in their straps. English, speak human, said one. He only looked at her occasionally, his eyes far more focused on a weapon and the mound of bodies. Snip rolled her jaw, adjusting her tongue to make the consonants and vowels of their language once again. I reckon I sling English well enough for these parts, Snip said. Their attention fell onto her, staring and making her wonder if she pronounced it all wrong. You mind if we fuel up? There ain't the pump master around here, just a cook in the kitchens. 
But if you reckon you can break them pipes yourself and settle your dues, you'll find a hearty reception when you ride back this way, said Snow. One of the humans let out a laugh, his face turning bright red as he nodded along. He made a few strange gestures and pointed over to the hydrogen pumps, but the crew were sluggish to move, their attention still fixed on Snow. We'll pay full price. We're honest mercenaries. How many of them did you kill? He said, nodding over to the side. They spoke strangely in short sentences, but she had a feel for what they were trying to say. All of them, but there was a good soul riding with me for the first twelve, she said. One of the humans turned to his captain. Oh, uh, can we? He said. The captain gave a sideways glance to the smiles on the crew's faces, her laugh slowly rising up and reddening his cheeks. We're, um, riding out to hunt vagabonds for coin. It beats cooking for a nowhere truck stop. Uh, if you're inclined, partner. Snip eyed the team. They looked just like a ragtag group from one of her books, the kind of adventure she had always wanted to go on. She grinned and quickly ran over anything that she needed to do before she left. The traps had already been disarmed. The bodies would rot, but someone else could clean that up. They wouldn't miss one of their cooks. They had plenty. She could make enough money to leave and not be stuck here like the rest of her kind. But the other sisters wouldn't leave, even if they could. They would stay and get hit with raid after raid, taking away what little profit they could make. I reckon I can't ride with you, for it seems my folks need a human more than you need a sifter, she said, her hand raising to the tip of a hat she wasn't wearing. I tip my hat to your generous offer, all the same, partner. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps, Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Caspar Arnold, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Light Jock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.